And today we're going to start with uh, segment one, which is OT protocols and devices. So very first question is gonna to go to Rob here. I wanna talk about ethernet slash IP. And so clearly when you look at the name ethernet slash IP, <laughs> the IP has got to mean internet protocol, right? Because there's no reason why anybody would assign a different definition to that particular acronym, right, Rob? It is, uh, you'd think so, you'd think so. Um, but no, we have uh, Ethernet IP over TCP UDP over IP over Ethernet sometimes. There's a, there's a whole stack going on there. Um, no, IP in this case stands for industrial protocol, and mm. it is the adaptation of the common industrial protocol for Ethernet networks. I see. And uh, tell us more about, about Ethernet IP. Like, because um, recently, recently, uh, industrial Ethernet has overtaken the older field bus uh, protocols. And Ethernet is actually now uh, representing uh, the largest plurality of, of mm -hmm. protocols used in OT spaces, right? So I think 15% uh, as of 2018. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you have found with Ethernet IP? Um, one thing that's really interesting about it is that uh, you're doing CIP uh, mm -hmm. on top of it, which is object oriented in nature. Do you see that object orientedness uh, coming over the wire when the protocol is encoded? Um, yes, to some extent. It's what's nice about what we're going for is uh, we're just getting device identification as, as you know, sort of our bread and butter. And we can lean on the the object orientedness and the message orientedness of it to to uh, get get devices to identify themselves very readily, which is um, really really nice uh, from my perspective. So it does my job for me almost. Mm. And is it is it guaranteed that 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 sort of um, object oriented nature shows up, or or is it uh, like hit or miss? There's there's a minimum set of stuff that is, uh, you know, mandated to be supported. Um, so usually we can get some amount of information uh, guaranteed to exist. Um, it's there's these protocols tend to be pretty. Uh, what's what's the word? They were some of these protocols were designed um, like Modbus, for example, back many years ago when the world wasn't quite as standardized. Yeah. Um, and so it's always fun when, uh, you know, we can look at some devices and they're like, oh, yes, I, you can identify me if you read these numeric addresses from this specific thing. But, you know, other things you can other protocols and other devices, you can say, please tell me your model number and manufacturer and your serial number and whatever. And it just comes across magically. And it's beautiful. So for, for those who are interested in the trivia, Modbus was started in 1979, making it almost as old as I am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it was started by a uh, modicon back in 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, but going back to Ethernet IP, Rob. So mm -hmm. uh, Ethernet IP, probably because it's more modern, and we're going to talk mm -hmm. about Modbus a little bit more later, probably because it's more modern, it actually has this concept of implicit messages and explicit messages, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea of having different types of messages for different types of purposes. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that uh, over coming over the wire? And, and is is that... You know, is either one or the other more useful for fingerprinting? So explicit messaging is considerably more useful, um, mm -hmm. at least in my experience, um, because you can just say things like, please tell me explicitly this, you know, uh, uh, I can query, get a query response, you know, back. Um, the implicit messaging is usually more for, uh, uh, what's the word? A telemetry. There we go. Sorry. Telemetry was the word I was trying to remember. So. Yes, it sounds like when I say telemetry, it sounds like work for NASA. It's great. So. Yeah, and for explicit messaging, more likely you're going to be doing things like um, uh, doing settings, right, and doing configuration, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which which may have more information. So, right, it makes sense that that explicit fingerprinting or explicit messages would be more useful for fingerprinting. Yep. Um, well, how do you feel about Ethernet IP having like dug into it so so deeply in in recent months? So. Uh... I 
I love, I truly love writing protocol parsers. Um, I, it, it's like, I love it. It's my favorite thing. One of my favorite things. Um, and Ethernet IP, as it, as far as it goes, was, was really pleasant to work with. Um, I did not, I've, I've written some stuff that was a little more, a little, uh, for some more, uh, esoteric protocols or more heavily layered protocols that um or or weirdly designed protocols that wasn't quite as fun but ethernet ip was really it it was it was very smooth sailing mm. i imagine it's probably because it's a little bit more modern than, than i modbus. i think that's got to be part of it yeah yeah all right so let's let's segue over to modbus then you know mm -hmm. the, the the older one uh you mm -hmm. know if we're going to talk about modbus right off the bat i have to ask um, which Modbus are you even talking about? Is it Modbus mm -hmm. ASCII, Modbus uh, RTU, uh, Modbus RTU that's encapsulated over TCP IP or the other mm -hmm. Modbus TCP IP that has the MBAP header uh, or are we talking <laughs> about M Mod Mod Modbus Plus? Like which which Modbus are, are we even talking about here? Mm -hmm. So usually they're, so Modbus, you know, funny you should mention it. Modbus, like you said, is from 1979, which, uh, makes it as as old as me um that's terrifying and it, it, modbus it, these industrial protocols you know it, modbus specifically in this case was designed in a time when computers and the the, the machinery involved were um uh much less powerful right i mean yeah, they, they would they would be considered you know uh it, it, humorously enough, my watch is obviously more powerful, but whatever, whatever. And so they had to be, and security was, you know, the, the security guard at the front gate of the company was also your security for your Modbus device, right? Like there was, there was no expectation that you could possibly connect to it from, you know, the Starbucks. Yeah, everything was air gap. You had to walk up to yep. it if you wanted to compromise it. Yeah. And so these protocols and the physical layers were different. You know, you might have a bunch of, you know, serial cables and, and whatever, you know, and now everything is, is sort of standardized on, on, uh, IP and Ethernet are starting to be that way. Um, so when when we talk about Modbus, we're talking about usually Modbus TCP, uh, and we're also preferably talking about Modbus that supports uh, the uh, Modbus encapsulated message format, which is sort of the extension mechanism that was added. I want to say around two thousand seven. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, I do remember uh, years ago uh, working for another company. <laughs> Um, we had just started doing some SCADA security and, uh, you know, these Modbus devices, you know, these systems were designed, like I said, with security as almost an afterthought. Um, and we were doing some things, you know, touching Modbus devices, probing them or whatever. And, uh, we did take down, uh, a factory briefly. Um, that was bad, <laughs> but thankfully it has gotten significantly more robust, in in recent times um and uh, although run zero is also extremely careful about this sort of thing which i'm proud to say so hmm. um so one thing about modbus is there's basically like four different types of areas in the device right there's two coils mm -hmm. and two registers right and the, the mm -hmm. coils are basically you know uh binary values and the coils are are your your uh, integers, although if you if you use two registers back to back or actually <laughs> one after, um, yeah, if you can't need two registers, then you can use like float, float or doubles. Mm -hmm. And what really gets me is that in Modbus, the the device designer can choose how many of these coils and how many of um, how many registers they want to have, and it's completely arbitrary. And it's basically mm -hmm. like entirely like a variable length you know data structure. And that's different for every single device. Like, what what does that mean for you as you were trying to essentially reverse engineer these various mm -hmm. various devices in order to fingerprint them? So there are some devices. So in there are some devices where you want to read certain coils, and that will actually tell you a model number or a version or something like that. But it's it's very device specific, and um, we do have a little bit of that. And then there was also uh, some messages. Modbus is very message oriented. So you, you send a message, you get a response. And there's a little, you know, it's very, it's a very simple protocol. It was designed to be parsed by much simpler computers. And you can say, uh, you know, please tell me your station ID, which is the ID of the device. And every now and again, some devices will support as an adjunct to that uh, arbitrary data, like 
um, manufacturer or something like that. But you've got to parse that out on a per device basis. Um, and then slightly more modern uh, Modbus devices support, like I said, the it, it's identify device and it's part of the encapsulated interface. And I can't remember, there's an M in there. I think it's just Modbus encapsulated interface. And that you can, uh, those devices, there's actually multiple levels of identification associated with that message type. So you can say, I want you know basic authentication, which is supposed to be supported by um, all Mudbus devices that support this encapsulated interface. And that will at least tell you uh, the software version and a integer, ident or I think it's an integer, identifying the, the model. Um, and then you can actually get even large, and then it, it actually becomes a little more object oriented and you can say, okay, now I want to, uh, if you support enhanced, uh, regular or enhanced um, levels of Modbus identification, you can say, okay, I've, it'll respond and say, oh, well, I've got, you know, three more objects that I can hand you that have an identifier and say, okay, now, and it, there's a, the, with the enhanced or the regular version, it can have manufacturer software name version, things like that. And then with the enhanced, it becomes, again, device specific, but in a much more structured way. And you can get really interesting things like device serial number or uh, uh, really, really anything they want. Manufacturer URL, that kind of thing can all be stuffed in there. Hmm. Uh, of course, these protocols are used on uh, many, many, many types of OTS and ICS devices. And mm -hmm. one type of device that you've been working on recently is the uh, Siemens Somatic S7, mm -hmm. right? So for those who yep. don't know, if you think... Uh, Microsoft, you think Windows. If you think Photoshop, you think Adobe. And if you think as, as Somatic, you you think mm -hmm. Siemens, right? Like Siemens became a name because of the Somatic um, uh, uh, models, and which started, I think, back in the 60s, 70s. And the S7 is like the fourth gen of, mm -hmm. of these types of devices, uh, which, and I say fourth gen, it fourth gen started in like 19, like 94, 95 ish. So it's, it's already more than 20 years old. Um, what, what, and, and you've been doing a lot of work with SM devices recently. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you say is the biggest like face palm um, that you have because, because of the work you've done with, with S7? So S7 um, is from, like you said, it's from a, it's from a different time. Uh, so S7 is built on, it is designed from a time when, you know, IP and TCP and, and all the stuff that we just kind of expect wasn't necessarily there. So S7, um, even today when it talks over TCP, inside that, it's layered inside an older uh, ISO ITU standard key packet, which is then inside its own connection oriented transport protocol that was the ISO sort of answer to TCP, so it fills the same gap. And then inside of that, you finally get into S7, which then also has some of its own session management stuff going on. So to to get to get to S7, you know, you've got a uh, uh, you telecom uh, folks out there will remember, you know, the seven layer burrito kind of thing. You know, you got You got to unwrap a lot of stuff to get just to get to the the, the meaty goodness of S7. Um, not that I'm complaining, it's there for a reason, but uh, it was it was definitely a lot of, okay, I've gotten into one layer, now I can get into the next layer, and then finally I get to the S7. Mm. A little trivia for, for a lot of folks, um, uh, many of you are familiar with Stuxnet, so Stuxnet, uh, what it did was actually look for the programming, uh, the programming environment for S7 devices, and it's called mm -hmm. Step7, so uh, the, the malware would go out and look for the, the Step7 programming environment, which then loaded the rootkit onto the S7 PLC. All right, so we've been talking a lot about OT and ICS, and you, we can't really talk about that with also talking about passive discovery. So, you know, mm -hmm. Rob, HD, Tom, like what would you say um, are the biggest challenges of trying to do the same type of fingerprinting with passive uh, sources as opposed to just, just active sources? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so when you look at passive traffic, uh, typically these devices aren't talking their management protocols all day long. They're speaking, you know, the data protocol instead. So you're reading a coil off Modbus, you're not interrogating the firmware, or the model version, things like that. So the best place to do passive fingerprinting of an OT device is between the HMI and the device themselves, because typically your HMI is actually the thing connecting and interrogating those devices to make sure it knows what the model numbers are. Now, funny enough, that's what Run Zero has done since day one. So we've been interrogating those OT devices as if we were an HMI and saying, tell me your model number, tell me your information. 
uh, which is why it's a safe scan in the first place. But that explains the kind of disconnect when folks think about, oh, don't run a scan against my OT devices versus, um, you know, if you run the scan only against um, the management protocols or supported by the device with the same, you know, level of care, you're, you're in a good spot. Um, but with the same token, like if you do passive discovery of a device that is not being interrogated by an HMI, you're not really going to see a lot of good information about the device. You're just going to see, you know, data reads, things like that. Any thoughts on that, Tom? No, that's, I mean, I think that's the key point. There's, you really don't get to pick what you see uh, passively unless you're just in the correct spot. Uh, for non-OT environments, there are some, some traffic that you can't elicit with a probe. And so it's nice to, like, for example, with CDP, you can see that traffic and capture it and extract information from it. But on the OT side, um, like, it's just the lack of selectivity of, of the data you get back. You, you really need to think about where you're putting that sensor. You get so the at the end of the day, the chattier, the better, right? Um, so Rob, I think you were saying earlier that um, Ethernet IP is chattier than Modbus, right? So I guess that's also another reason why you might prefer Ethernet IP over or over Modbus for uh, for fingerprinting. Mm -hmm. Although, as HD was saying, it's always great when uh, uh, if you're doing passive discovery, um, if somebody else just happens to send a really great query and says, please tell me everything about you, you know, we just happen to see that response. And, and our uh, our passive discovery goes through the same decoding pathway, I guess you would call it, as our active probe. So anything we can do actively, we can do passively. Uh, and then some, which is which is really rad. Um, but yeah, it's always convenient when it's you see the HMI do a query, and we just find everything that the HMI finds without having mm. to do anything. Yeah, and funny yeah. that some products. If there's a another product that you know not run zero, but it's designed to capture OT traffic and do fingerprinting, it's going to give you the best results if you run run zero scan, <laughs> which is just kind of it, a little bit hilarious about how it works that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's always better when somebody else is doing an expose and you happen to just be listening in and gather all the information. <laughs> all right, excellent. Um, so I think this is going to close out our segment on OT protocols and devices. I would like to jump over to our next segment here, which is about outliers. And so this one, we're going to lead off with HD here. There is an argument to be made that. Uh, when you are trying to improve your security posture for your network, for your organization, that vulnerability scanning, while important and needs to be done, may uh, not necessarily be the only tactic that you can employ, that there are other tactics that can help you improve your security posture. And uh, recently, you've done some talks where you've argued that hunting for outliers on the network could be one of those tactics that, that could complement vulnerability scanning. Do you, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Sure. Um, if you look at uh, anomaly detection in the history of InfoSec, um, there's been dozens of companies created and immediately failed because they thought, hey, look, I found something that's weird. Therefore, this is now our product. I can tell you when weird things happen. Therefore, this is my business model. Then they go live and realize every network is different and they're constantly changing. And you kind of like stumble around a little bit. Do you finally say, okay, we're just going to do signature-based analysis instead? And that's the entire IDS industry in a nutshell, in a lot of ways. Um, it's really difficult to do anomaly Base detection only of bad things uh, because things are so different. But there are some, you know, pretty clear things you can look for. So what is, you know, let's say you look at an inventory of assets or services and you're saying, what of these things should be common and is not common? Like for example, all your devices should be running the same OS if it's a network full of Windows endpoints that you expect Windows. You see a not Windows device, obviously there's something weird about that. You want to go investigate why do I have a not Windows device in my endpoint network? So that's an example of like looking for things that um, you know should be common but aren't common in that case. There's the flip side though, which is what are the things that uh, should not be common, but you see more than one of? Like for example, any kind of unique identifier on an asset, an SH host key, any kind of cryptographic material, um, a random ID from an SNP handshake, things like that, they should never be duplicated across devices. There's a you know infinite chance or in, infinitely tiny chance of those devices ever reusing it by, by accident, right? So if you see more than one device with the same SH host key, you got a problem. That machine's ever you know been cloned. It's a hard-coded SH host key in the firmware of that device things like that. So if you just look at, you know, you go into like your inventory, you export all your assets, you sort them based on whatever field you like, and you look at the long tail of that, you say, what is the stuff that's, you know, kind of at the bottom of my, my sorted list? That's almost always a good place to start for security investigation. Um, it just, you find the easy stuff right away and you don't have to care whether or not it's vulnerable. You just know that it's weird and that's usually good enough to get started. Um, now that's a good starting point, but it's not really, you know, enough. So what we do with Run Zero 
is we uh, create an outlier rank for every asset within every site that's constantly being updated within the context of that site. So something's only an outlier compared to its neighbors and its neighbors are within that particular site within the run of, run of your UI. So we'll create features for everything from like OS hardware, uh, TTLs, window size, services, protocols, combination of ports open, things like that. Uh, then we'll basically compare all those features across all those assets and say, which one of these things doesn't look like the other ones? What are what the commonalities, what are the not commonalities? Uh, we turn that into an outlier rank. So that's a really neat way to say, like, I want to find all the weird stuff that I probably need to investigate just by going to the console and saying sort descending by the outlier rank, and you see all the weird stuff bubble to the top right away. So it's a great starting point there. Um, you know, so the question is if you can find um, you know, your weird stuff that quickly, like how does that correlate to risky assets compared to like, you know, the results of a vulnerability management solution for the same systems? So we took a, a deeper look at that. We said, let's go look at 500,000 data points across like lots of anonymized uh, data. Uh, anybody who had imported third-party vuln data and also had a run zero scan, and we've got an outlier score for it. How well does a low outlier rank correlate with a high risk rank uh, on the vulnerability management side? And it was almost perfect. Like if you look at the uh, assets with a really low out outlier score, on average, they also had a really low risk score from mobile management. If you look at the ones with a really high outlier score, they typically had critical risk vulnerabilities on that device as well. So it became a really good correlation to anytime you see a device with a really high outlier score, there's a good chance that thing has some level of exposure. Even if you haven't run a vuln scan against it, it's probably a good place to start anyways because of that correlation. Then the question was, okay, what if we go the other way? If we look at um, looking devices with, uh, you know, if you look at devices with a low outlier score, are they always going to be secure? And obviously not, right? You still need a bone scanner. Um, you're not gonna be able to replace your bone scanner with something that uh, is just telling you whether it's weird or not weird, because you could have a network full of, you know, ancient HMIs that haven't been updated in 20 years, and none of those devices will be weird, but they're all gonna be a tire fire for security. So it doesn't really tell you very much from that perspective. Um, so yeah, there's lots of ways to slice and dice that. Uh, you know, Rob, Tom, do you have any thoughts on the outlier side? Yeah, I've in my in past life I've worked in uh, defensive uh, I, uh, infosec as well as IT and financial environments and software vendors and things like that, and I've absolutely used this in production in the past with vulnerability management um, solutions. Um, you always care about why do I have one of a thing or a handful of a thing. Uh, with the eye towards, like you said, uh, the risk is probably higher there, but also like odds are your your existing standard controls for patch management for vulnerability management things like that don't work as well for your outliers because they 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 differ from your primary environment. And even if it's even if your security controls are still covering up things like AB and patch management, your your general risk management might not address it. Your business continuity probably doesn't address it. Like if you've got that one box that's sitting in a corner and it's running some weird access database or or Microsoft SQL developer edition running an application, like the odds that you've got that folded into your business continuity plan are probably pretty low. It's it's not something your IT even probably knows about, and they certainly don't have a plan to do backup and recovery. They don't have RPOs and RTOs and things like that. So like it's out, it doesn't, they generally don't conform or fit into or accounted for your your the, almost any aspect of your program. So even if like the department who runs it knows about it, it doesn't fit into the larger framework of how you operate uh, risk control, operate and manage risk uh, in your environment. The, the yeah, legend always... of the the IPX box behind the wall, you know, that had just been running for years. Seen it with NetWare, seen it with SQL, seen it with a ton of things. OS2. Yep. Mm -hmm. OS2 warp, man. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there, there aren't going to be, there isn't going to be endpoint detection response for, for you know, OS2, Atari, Commodore, or, or, or NetWare, right, if, if that's still around. I and mean, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find any sort of security controls for, for NT4 either. Right, mm. which uh, well, that that's an acronym that didn't age well. As far as I know, NT, NT stands for New Technology. <laughs> there, there's there's an old joke, and I this is going to be super nerdy, so forgive me. There's the thing about HAL from 2001 as IBM. The letters shifted forward. Um, so one of the principal architects of Windows NT worked at DEC on the VMS project, and somebody pointed out just like IBM and HAL is one letter shifted forward. WNT is VMS shifted one letter forward. So maybe uh -huh. it's like, eh. So, and oh, what was his name? I can't remember. His I don't name, remember, but, yeah. but I've, I've heard this. Like he was like the lead architect on, mm -hmm, on VAX mm -hmm. VMS. And then he got hired at Microsoft. Yep. And I was told like he was trying to like fix the mistakes from, from uh, you know, mm -hmm. architecting VAX VMS. Uh, oh, VMS so is a beautiful I, system. So, so really NT is the, 
the new vax mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. there are it's internal references to that yeah there are internal references to uh to vms there and uh, i don't recall what they were but they persisted for quite a while mm -hmm. yeah rob did i hear you say that you thought the vax is, is a beautiful uh Oh, it's beautiful. I, I, it, we don't have time, but I will tell you, I got into InfoSec uh, as a as a teenager because of VMS. One day I will tell you that story when we have more time. Mm -hmm. so. I So uh, there is a Unix as well as VAX system administrator from my college days who would absolutely agree with you. Like he, he hands down, like always chose uh, the VAX system over Unix system for years. Uh, but... Uh, I'm sure he's retired by now, so no longer. But uh, that VMS system is still running reliably. Yeah, they never retire. <laughs> yeah, potentially, <laughs> potentially. I don't know. Like the the college uh, main DNS server was was run, run on back. so I guess I could always check. Uh, but we'll find out some other time, I guess. Um, but HD, going back to your main point here, uh, which is that. There are some cases where outlier indicates something that the security team should look into. There are other cases, though, where the distribution uh, should is not expected to be some sort of bell curve, but you should always be uh, not a, a completely linear, like a uh, uniform distribution, because there should only be one of that value. It should always be unique, like SSH keys and and things like this. And it's important for the security teams to really be aware of both. Run zero product, make it easy to go find that stuff. So if you're like looking at a NASA detail and you click on the IPTTL source attribute and you click on the left side search icon, it'll then do a grouped report of the entire inventory showing you which devices have the most frequent and the least frequent uh, versions of that particular attribute. So what I love doing is like going into an environment where you don't know anything about anything, but you want to find all your IoT stuff in one shot. You look for anything that has a TCP window size that doesn't match the three or four standard values for Linux and Windows and VSD and Mac OS. And that's all of them. You effectively find anything that's not 65535, 14480, 28600, or like 62420, whatever the uh, the window ones are offhand, the Windows ones are offhand. Um, and that um, TCP max segment size is all you need to find all of your RTOS and embedded devices in one query. It's pretty, pretty fun. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so looking at the time here, we're going to move on to our next topic, which is oddities of the month or Tales from the Trenches, <laughs> which is what, how I like to think of it. We're going to start here with uh, the Click Modular Router. So HD, the the Click Modular Router, to my mind, is, I mean, it's a, it's a great idea, right? This open source, like, reinvention of, of um, routing code, essentially, right? As opposed to, like, the hodgepodge of technical debt that, you know, many of the the, the routing vendors probably have in, in their code bases. Um, but the learning curve for click modular router is really high. And it's, as far as I can tell, not necessarily widely adopted. So how did you even come across this, this, this odd, oddball thing? Sure. I mean, one thing we spend a lot of time um, on here is just staring at data, right? Trying to figure out what is this protocol and support? What is this weird response we saw we didn't expect? And super early on, like I think even before Run Zero was even a company, uh, I was looking at some results from a um, live pen test I was doing, and I saw this weird thing on port 20,000. And I was asking my coworker about it, and he's like, I don't know what this thing is. We see it occasionally here and there. It seems like it has a command response protocol. It's kind of like Telnet, but it has like weird XML-ish like Lua responses. Um, it's JSON on some spots. So we started digging into it. Ends up there's you know the academic project called Click Modular Router, which is a way to do entire user land um, IP router configuration effectively. So you, you have a kernel module that assists, but typically you're doing like these big programmatic uh, ways to configure you know, ports and switching a layer two and layer three and things like that. So kind of like early days of um, SD WAN in that sense, um, or software software defined networking in general. Um, so we started digging around and trying to figure out what it was. We figured out, found the command, the command, the command protocol for it, looked at the open source project, started poking on it, um, but we still didn't know what these devices were. So within Run Zero, we added a probe that says, hey, if we think it looks like a click socket banner, go ahead and call the read packages function and see what it returns. And that returns a whole bunch of data about the device, like MAC adders, network configuration. Um, in, a, in a couple of cases, we saw things like uh, WPA2 keys leaked. But then we wait, wait, hold on, with, with or without authentication? Oh, of course not. Like this is just wide open port 20,000. But the weird thing is we couldn't figure out what the OS these devices were. They had no other ports open. They didn't respond to anything. We're like, what is this device? Like, 
we we know all the stuff of, we can dump everything about this configuration of click module router and we know nothing about the, the instance itself digging a little bit further we finally found um one of the configuration items that got dumped mentioned elts underscore meraki as a kernel module and we're like oh crud <laughs> So we reach out to Cisco, of course, and it's like, hey, we're seeing some Iraqi devices out there with this weird click modular router port exposed directly to their network. Uh, no authentication, read, write, effectively, you can reconfigure these things, do whatever you want. Like, this is bad. Um, where do you know about it? Is there a security advisory? And it took like six to seven months, I think, of just going back and forth. And they couldn't point to any particular fix that fixed it, but they couldn't point to any current versions being affected by it. And we still see them showing up in the world. And they typically are older versions, right? Like the older, you know, uh, some of the older managed routers, older managed switches, uh, older managed WAPs as well. But what's odd about it is there's no public reference with this thing. You search for click module router in Meraki, you find nothing. There's no information, there's no security advisory, and we still see them pop up here and there. So it's things like that that I think like just kind of the things that go bump in the night, if you will, here that kind of keep me up, like trying to figure out like what is this thing? How do we make sure like people are aware of it? How do we how do you do it? So it's one of those things where we actually created a custom bone report check in, within Run Zero to tell you about it if we see it. Just because it is something that like you really don't want your whole network configuration of your Meraki device exposed to the network without authentication. And we also don't know what the remediation is because the vendor doesn't know either. Right. So what's interesting is the primary author for Click Modular Router, he's a professor and he used to work for Meraki. That explains a lot. And I don't I don't know if he started on Click Modular Router while he was working at well, Cisco or Meraki when it was its own company, but uh there, there may have been some overlap, uh, apparently, if, if, if that's what you're seeing over the wire, then, oh, that is fascinating. Okay. Yeah. And new hardware doesn't seem to have that problem at all. And there's even a, as of like two weeks ago, there's a, a new version of click module router called fast click, which is kind of a, a the new snazzy version of click module. Right. Router. By a different author. Yeah. By a different yeah. author. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing those showing up in unauthenticated network device ports in the future, but I don't know how long it will take. Oh man. I mean, it's basically a treasure trove for the adversary if they come across it. Yeah, literally your entire like SD WAN configuration gets dumped out. Like every possible can, think about layer two, layer three, WAP, etc. Watch after this webcast, there's going to be more scans of port uh, twenty thousand. <laughs> All right, All right, let's move on to uh, the next uh, oddball for the month, which is Apache Zookeeper. Right for for those who are trying to manage distributed services. Um, they, you'll be familiar with Apache Zookeeper. It's also used in many, many other Apache projects. Uh, so, so HD, like, are, are we are we fingerprinting like the the Zookeeper clients? Are we uh, fingerprinting the the applications that use the Zookeeper clients? Or are we just um, doing the the Zookeeper servers in their ensembles? So, Zookeeper itself is more of like a like a HashiCorp vault daemon or like an etcd or a console. It's supposed to be kind of a central um, service that you can store key value pairs in that are secrets. So if you ever see Zookeeper exposed to the network, like you got problems. Like you do not want this thing exposed to the network ever uh, because the entire point of it is to store and retrieve your secrets. So um, what's interesting about Zookeeper is, you know, it should never be exposed to the network. It has an IP ACL system that is often turned on properly in a lot of places, but you also see it just exposed with no authentication to the network as well. The weird thing about Zookeeper though, is that uh, it, uh, when it's detected by your typical bone management tools, they report it as a, oh, look, we found Zookeeper. Here's an information level vulnerability. It's like, guys, like it's a little bit bigger than that. Like you probably want to care a little more about this issue than the fact that it's info level. So we did some um, light internet wide scans, a little bit of poking and prodding of kind of like what stuff was out there, what was affected, what type of devices. Um, we found all kinds of horrible stuff. Uh, I think there was a server hosted in Tencent that was dumping out RSA keys, AWS API keys, cloud keys, signing keys, you name it. Like every possible secret you could ever store ever was just coming out of this device over the internet. Um, we see them across um, internal environments as well. And typically in kind of distributed computing stacks, like someone has like a really big, like, you know, Kubernetes cluster and etcd is part of that component. Oftentimes it gets misconfigured where that daemon gets exposed externally versus internally. So that's the case where, you know, it's a really nasty misconfiguration. Nothing really detects it very well today. We had to kind of go and build our own detection for it and run zero just so that folks are aware of it. So if you do have one of these exposed in your network and you look at your queries tab and look at the, the match count, it should tell you whether we found any, so, found any of these so far. And you can have it exposed in the network and not be unauthenticated. Those typically have IP ACLs, but, you know, depending on how close you are to the asset, IP ACLs may not save you either. And and the, the information that's... Uh leaked out, I mean, it would give indication as to the clients that are within that environment and potentially allows the adversary to understand like that application that's running, which 
which you know potentially is business critical depending on who you are. Um, I mean, uh, I so typically you have all the cloud secrets. You have the, you have credentials to reconfigure the entire application. You can also rewrite the configuration and say, oh, load your code from here instead. And so you want to replace what jar file it loads from a particular application. Uh, we saw a large telecom that uh, external on the internet exposing a zookeeper that would load arbitrary jar files off one of the keys for the application that was deployed. So it's it's really nasty stuff. And it's it's weird that we find, you know, we kind of look at like the entire, you know, uh, attack surface of, you know, the world, if you will, and we try to figure out what stuff is not being covered by other folks. And this is definitely one that jumped out recently as something that people should care about, but they don't really know about it today. Yeah, it's and the price you pay for atomic operations and consistency is just dumping your entire application on the internet. Yeah, um, so good, good call out. And we're going to move on to the next one, which is a larger topic, which is the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, Section 889 devices. Uh, for those of you who are in uh, the UK, um, this um, actually, I should explain what NDA 889 is. So basically, these are devices that have been prohibited by the US government uh, for any use by government contractors. Um, and, and these devices are the ones that are, are telecom or video surveillance equipment. And the specific vendors that were called out were Huawei. Um, ZTE, uh, High Tech, High Terra, Hike Vision, and as well as Dahua, right? And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit specifically about Hike Vision and Dahua because they're the ones that are the primary um, uh, video uh, camera vendors, right? Uh, in fact, Hike Vision is the largest vendor for for video surveillance, and Dahua is the second largest in the world. Uh, for those of you who are in Europe. Uh, you, the UK procurement bill from uh, June of earlier this year was going to set up a national security unit for pro procurement to investigate suppliers that might um, pose some sort of national uh, risk to national security. And then similarly in Australia, uh, back in February uh, of this year, the Australian De Department of Defense uh, announced that they were going to remove all uh, Hike Vision and Tahua uh, cameras from their facilities. So. Uh, all around, this is a this is a big topic, but um, runs. But HD, uh, you've you've done a lot of work here specifically uh, around these types of Section eight and nine devices. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit more? Um, sure. So it's it's interesting because the eight eight nine was kind of the first um, piece, if you will, uh, and that says you cannot have these devices on your federal network, and your federal contractors also can't use these devices. Uh, and in 2021, FCC also came out and said, you also can't provide telecommunication services to the government or government contractors with these devices either. So this really turned into kind of what they've been calling like the Chinese manufacturer ban in a lot of ways. Um, and the uh, Huawei, ZTE, Dehua, Hike Vision, there's a bunch of other ones that are kind of in this bucket. A lot of them, a lot of these devices are networking, switching, um, other types of kind of like consumer electronics, uh, but also a lot of surveillance equipment. So a lot of DVRs, MVRs, cameras, things like that are made by these folks. Uh, the scary part is these things are actually white labeled as well and resold under U.S. brand names. So almost any camera you buy in the U.S. with a U.S. label on it is actually going to be a rebranded ZT, Huawei, Dehua, High K Vision camera under the hood. Even if it's not uh, the the board itself, it's the sock. It's the High K Vision sock either way. So you're still using the same chip, the same flash, and typically the same um, somewhat suspect looking firmware. Uh, the scary thing about these is there's a lot of kind of uh, cases where uh, they end up in places where you don't expect. So we had a, a federal uh, contractor customer who does uh, staffing overseas in you know, usually pretty secure locations. And they got a report from us saying, hey, there's a Huawei device on your network. And they said, well, we can't have that. That's against all of our rules. We have to we have to tear it out. Where is it? And we said, well, here's the Mac. Here's where it is. It's hanging off the switch. We don't know much more than that. Um, you know, Let us know if we can help. They spent, like I think, a month and a half digging into it, replacing every single piece of equipment in the entire lab from scratch. And again, again, they're like, we think you're lying. We think your stuff is broken. Like, we swear, we're not making this up. There's a Huawei device with this Mac address last connected 10 minutes ago right here. Um, so we finally um, figured it out. It was the network tech had a Huawei P series phone in his front pocket the entire time. And it was his own phone while he's tearing the lab out trying to find the Huawei device. So it was one of those cases where, like, they were getting really nervous because they had to have to go up to a judge. Like, I mean, the penalties for this stuff get pretty, pretty severe. Uh, but it's really hard to, you know, no one would think that the phone in their pocket was the, the cause of the problem. So, I mean, basically, this was like a quantum mechanics experiment where the observer was affecting the ex the experiment itself. So, like, you know, you, it's either a Huawei phone or it's Schrodinger's cat. Which one? 
<laughs> That's the, the old joke about the the uh, steel toed boots and the metal detector. So you keep digging because the metal detector keeps going off. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and and the thing is, what what really gets me is there's there's real evidence that there's a cause for concern here, right? The, these government entities are not just like making this up. Um, the there was a there was a a company, a Refirm Labs, in 2017, they actually found a backdoor. Uh, in in uh, Tahua uh, devices, and then the the vendor obviously you know uh, I think after some back and forth the, the vendor uh, uh, released a patch, uh, presumably to get rid of that back door. But Refirm Labs found out that all they had did was actually move that back door code to a different part of the firmware, uh, so they didn't actually get rid of it. Um, and in fact, uh, among Run Zero customers, we we've also seen evidence of. Uh, some of these types of devices uh, reaching out to uh, uh, an IP address uh, in China, even though, you know, our customer, that, that organization had no business connections or dealings with with anybody in China. So it just, it was, um, it's, it was rather surprising and uh, uh, a little concerning for, for, for uh, this particular organization when they found out and, they uh, were able to quickly identify which are all the the 89 devices that they have on their network so they can go ahead and uh, schedule this for for removal but uh, all in all very very interesting topic I do want to just call I know we're a little short on time for this but uh, one of the reasons you see a lot of these exposed the internet that you really would not expect to especially with the high K vision or Hick vision uh, cameras is that they will actually cut a hole in the firewall to expose themselves if you're a you know you know, normal consumer and you've got an off-the-shelf firewall from your ISP and you plug a do a camera in, it's going to talk UPnP to your firewall, open up all those management ports and expose itself directly to the internet where its backdoors are reachable. So it's it's pretty terrifying in the sense that like, it's not just that it's a crappy IoT device in your network. Like, no, no, it'll carve its own hole and invite the world in. Yeah, it's it's not an accident. Like they, there there's effort behind uh... Uh, this this um, phoning home activity. I was, was going to say, I just wanted to refocus on the fact that a lot of companies, uh, as HD mentioned, have these and don't know it. Like you you bought a brand that you thought was not Chinese, it was you know local or whatever, and it's totally a rebranded white box version of something else. So even if you think you're good, you should like audit the chain for your devices uh, to make sure that they are what you think they are. Um, because so many of them, when we were doing the research, uh, were rebranded white box. Very, very good point. All right, um, gonna move on to the last segment here of our Run Zero Hour webcast. Thank you for all of you who have stuck with us through uh, the first uh, 47 minutes here. We're gonna do a roundup of this year's rapid response. So for those of you who are not aware, uh, the research team, the, the three folks here that you're looking at, they regularly release new queries in Run Zero to help you go and identify devices that are potentially vulnerable to something, whether that be an insecure configuration or a new CVE that's out in the wild. And this is all done through uh, asset details, right? Using this information about these devices in order to uh, give you uh, uh, the telltale signs to say, aha, these devices are probably the ones that are vulnerable. Let me go and take a look at those first, even before your, your vuln scanner might be ready. To, to do a, a volume check on those devices. So, um, and, and these are these are published regularly on our website as well as on our social media. And we're today we're gonna go through like a roundup of the, the most something rapid response of the year for each one person here. So so Tom, you chose Move It. This is the most what to you of, of this past year. Yeah, for me, this, this would be uh, the most impactful. Um... You know, this uh, for context, this is a vulnerability or actually a series of vulnerabilities. I think there were at least five CVEs released uh, in this product in a very short period of time, but it's a, a vulnerability and move its um, hosted and uh, on prem file transfer software that allowed pre authentication basically take over the device. Uh, you were able to run SQL injection, uh, run perform SQL injection on the database, and then leverage that into uh, to, uh, access and control on the device. And ransomware, at least one ransomware actor, uh, Klopp, has been using it to steal massive amounts of data uh, throughout this year. Uh, it was detected prior to a patch being available, so it was O'Day. Um, there were known attacks back in May, in late May. Um, Progress released a patch at the end of May, like around May 30th or so. Um, actually, no, they, they released it at the beginning of June. 
uh, and raised awareness about it. And um, like since then, have been repeated notifications about various entities have been compromised and they're big entities. They're not like your mom and pop shops. They are major government schools, uh, healthcare providers um, that have that have announced that they've been breached. There's this one uh, this one vendor that I'm not familiar with, MCSoft, that appears to be an EDR vendor that tracks this. And th they claim that something like 2,600 organizations uh, and 83, almost 84 million individuals have been impacted. And I believe this. I have, um, I've seen, I, I feel like if they're not correct, they're in the ballpark. I've seen letters from um, claims providers um, who do uh, medical claims for things like Blue Cross Blue Shield where they were compromised and they didn't catch it until weeks after the event had occurred. They didn't know they had PII compromised until two months after the fact. And then later they started, like two months later, they started notifying customers. And it, the, 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 the impact for it for me is not just the prevalence of it, but the fact that this product is used to exchange data between organizations and that data sometimes is in volume and a sensitive nature. And it seems like organizations were not routinely cleaning that data up, so they're leaving it. Like in the case I was mentioning earlier, the data that got compromised on this individual, that individual had no relationship with the healthcare provider for a year prior, but their data was still in this box and being compromised. And so you've got this large blast radius, but you've got this long tail of people who really should not have been impacted at all through this compromise, but these organizations are not keeping these, uh, they're not keeping, uh, removing the data and cleaning up. And so it's being, it's being compromised and they're they're being ransomware as a result of it. it's like you know pay clop or we're going to release all this data and so you have a bunch of people who have been sort of caught in the crossfire there who through no fault of their own have had incredibly private information healthcare records treatment records pii of all kinds um school records and uh financial records all these different things that are incredibly sensitive that have been compromised or threatened to be compromised if the ransomware wasn't paid and so for me, that like, that's why it stands out. Stuff still going on, and it's just been constant. Like, Klopp has just la laid waste to massive amounts of, or not laid waste, but like compromised mass massive amounts of information. And then after the compromise, they started throwing out the ransomware. So, like, they've already got the data. Like, I, I've already got the information. They've already done a lot of the harm. Now they're just sitting back and collecting money, is what it seems like from the outside. So, so for me, Move It is definitely like the, the, um, the, vulnerability of the year yeah i think i think ramifications are, are going to be forthcoming for months potentially you know a couple of years to come on this one for sure all right rob let's go to you you picked cisco ios xe this is the most what for the year uh it's the most interesting to me um so cisco i uh ios xe is you know uh cisco's you know, it, iOS was their original operating system, and now iOS XE is sort of their Linux-based version of iOS and, and all that, um, which is funny. I have not actually been responsible for administering a Cisco router for, for probably a decade or longer, and I still will just type, you know, show IP in brief uh, when, I, when I open a terminal sometimes, just because, you know, good old times, right? Uh, good times. Um, but no, iOS XE, the vulnerability there was the most interesting to me uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that at a certain level, the internet is uh, built on duct tape and bailing wire and uh, and a lot of mutual trust. Um, like the entire internet depends on people ignoring BGP advertisements um, kind of thing. It's like, otherwise it would all just fall apart. Uh, and so some of these routers were, were relatively, you know, or core-ish, core adjacent routers that could be popped. Um, and I think at one point they were estimating that it was what 60 or 70,000 of these routers had been compromised and potentially had, uh, uh, persistence mechanisms, uh, perform to actually get like persistent, uh, toe holds in the device and you could get total compromise. Um, it was, uh, so it was one of those things where I was curious to see just, uh, it, it, I wanted to see just how bad it could get. Um, not, I love your president. I didn't want to see just how bad it could get. I was scared of how bad it could get. So for me, that's, that's why, uh, that was the, the vulnerability of the year, which is a, a, uh, you should make a little statue or something and you know, hold it yeah. up. Yeah. And the, the internet is definitely more fragile than people think. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately. 
I was just going to add on is like, it's not just data availability uh, impact as well. Uh, if I recall correctly, Cisco iOS XE also has voice services, sort of like what the mm -hmm. Cisco used to do with the cubes. So it can impact voice, you know, VoIP uh, communications as well, or give access to potentially mm -hmm. VoIP uh, communications as well. So it's not just your typical data uh, access and availability models, like it impacts things that people might necessarily, not necessarily think about, like uh, voice. Mm -hmm. I remember Tom years ago, not that long ago, somebody said, oh, uh, by whatever year, 75% of phone calls will be will be transiting over IP. And I was like, no, oh, no, that's not going to happen. No, no, yeah. All right. So for myself, I chose a Team City. For me, this is the most likely to be a ticking time bomb, right? So this particular rap response was around a vulnerability for the, the build system, the CICD pipeline uh, module for, that comes from JetBrains. And it's used by uh, something like, 80% uh, of Fortune 100 companies, like it's basically everywhere. And this is uh, a huge uh, supply chain risk for any company that uses it. And I think they have something like 30,000 customers. And I was digging a little bit deeper into this. Apparently in 2021, JetBrains was, um, was not, the, the organization wasn't being investigated, but the, the investigators were looking at to see if the, um, JetBrains was used as part of the attack chain in SolarWinds, that potentially the adversary used, um, used a team cities to then inject the code into the SolarWinds code, which then of course got, you know, everybody knows the, the, the rest of that history. Uh, so, you know, this to me is potentially the biggest ticking time bomb. And of course, Lazarus Group and, and other folks uh, from North Korea apparently have already been exploiting it uh, before uh, before they they've uh, they've been patched. Um, you know, uh, you see reports from Gray Noise and some other folks that show that you know even after the patch was released, many organizations still have not patched. Team Cities is still publicly accessible in many many cases, and we don't know what the ramifications of this are. You know, potentially. Years down the line, we may find out that hey, there was a supply chain um, related uh, attack, and it came from you know this 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 year, twenty twenty three. So, to my mind, that's uh, the the biggest potential for being a ticking time bomb. All right, and let's come to the last one here. HD, you chose Active MQ. Why? <laughs> it was the most uh, trivially exploitable bug that looked more complicated of the year. So you know, Active MQ. Um, I believe it's Java based. Uh, it, it was uh, vulnerable to a, um, a deserialization attack uh, where you can basically instantiate a Java object and make it do bad things. Uh, typically, ActiveMQ is on all kinds of stuff. It's a it's a message broker, so you find it on all kinds of like hubs and devices and home consumer electronics and everything else in between. Uh, it's also part of like big distributed computing stacks, so it's really common to find it kind of you know cohabitating with some other service like some web app, some you know uh, web productivity tool or, or an appliance. Uh, what was strange about this one is that typically deserialization de attacks require all kinds of like hoop jumping to find the right gadget. It depends on which version of job we're using. In this case, the entire exploit was like four bytes about of stub and then just XML payload with a, a you know Java runtime exec. It was crazy trivial to exploit. A single post request, no session required. Uh, I was just amazed at like how easily exploitable it was given how these attacks are typically more complicated to, to pull off. Um, and there's active exploitation exploitation almost immediately before uh, uh, most folks were even aware of the vulnerability. Um, one thing to call out here, all four of these bugs we've talked about here, these are cases where attackers were actively exploiting them before most people were even aware of them. And we're seeing that time window between awareness of an exposure and you know people being ransomware getting smaller and smaller and often negative at this point. In the case of iOS XE, the initial advisory from the vendor said, hey, here's the IOCs for if you've been already been breached by this state sponsored actor. It's like, that probably should be part of your initial advisory. You're kind of already behind the gun on that. And a patch wasn't available for another week after. So it's, you know, it's an example of just kind of how, um, how terrible the timing is these days for some of these upcoming vulnerabilities. All right. And that rounds out our year-end rapid response uh, roundup. Uh, unfortunately, we are at time, so we won't be answering questions live. However, I'll be following up with you offline uh, if you have asked a question here. 
All right. So I want to thank Rob, HD, and Tom. Thank you so much for a great hour. It's been a lot of content, uh, very illuminating. And everybody, uh, I look forward to seeing you next month at the next Run Zero Hour. Uh, it'll be in, in January. Thank you.